Welcome back, or welcome to Grateful and Full of Greatness. I'm your host, Mark Lassini. On this podcast, I sit down with guests who, in my opinion, live their lives with the pursuit of greatness in mind. This platform provides an opportunity to discuss and to explain strategies that go into reaching peak performance. This is episode number 17. My guest is Steve Govett, current president of JSI Sports USA and the National Lacrosse League San Diego Seals, a former Team Canada men's national team player. Steve has, Steve has been a well-known professional and executive inside the National Lacrosse League, or NLL, for decades. To add to his leadership in international and professional lacrosse, Steve was unanimously voted into the World Lacrosse Board of Directors earlier this month. As a player for the San Diego Seals, I'm fortunate enough to witness and experience Steve's empathy and expertise firsthand. With his longtime roles within lacrosse and various leadership positions, I'm excited to dive into this one. Steve, thank you so much for taking the time to join me. Mark, it's a pleasure being on. I, you know, when you do introductions like that and people start using words like decades, it <laughs> starts to give you like this pain in your heart. Maybe that's just angina. I don't know. It's just, uh, yeah, it, I appreciate the introduction. Uh, it's, uh, it's certainly been a long road in the National Lacrosse League and uh, in the sport of lacrosse. Well, I, we're, we're going to stay on that thread. I'm gonna, I'd like to start where, where it started for you. Lacrosse has taken you from Western Canada to the East Coast of the United States to Colorado and now San Diego and probably all over the world. Uh, can you share your earliest memories of where you picked up lacrosse, when, and why you stuck with it for so long? Yeah, so uh, – <laughs> Uh, for those people that are familiar with the National Lacrosse League, um, you're probably familiar with Ben McIntosh and Garrett McIntosh. And uh, Mark, I know you don't know this story because you've probably never heard it, but um, their grandmother uh, is, was a neighbor of ours um, with, with their family and Jim, uh, Jim McIntosh, whose father, Ben and Garrett, and their, his younger brother, Tom, who was my best friend, my my age when I was like four years old said, uh, called my mom and said, does Stevie want to play lacrosse? And my mom turns to me and says, Stevie, do you want to play lacrosse? And Stevie says, yeah, 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 yeah. I want to play lacrosse. I want to play lacrosse. And uh, she hangs up and I said, mom, what's lacrosse? <laughs> um, and, and so there I started uh, kind of down this road at, at four and a half years old uh, and remember going to, you know, it's funny because full circle, it, going to clinics in a school gym where, you know, there were a number of sticks, right? Wooden sticks at the time. Um, and there were, you know, some instructors there and they were letting us run around and, and teaching us the game. And, and I guess caught the bug at that particular point in time in Burnaby, British Columbia, where I grew up, which was and still is a hotbed of the game of box lacrosse. Uh, but yeah, um, that, that's my earliest memories. Amazingly enough, right, the seed is planted so early um, with, with young kids by actually letting them participate and see and touch and feel kind of that visceral effect of, of the game of lacrosse. And, and once you get it, uh, as you know, and, and all of our colleagues know, once, once you kind of get it, it gets into your bones and gets into your blood and, and you start to embrace um, – this fantastic culture of our game and, and it sparks uh, a long history for me. And I know a lot of others that have, uh, have gained a lot of passion for the game, whether they grew up in New Jersey, like yourself, or, uh, you know, the West coast here in California or, or all over Canada. Um, those opportunities exist because somebody put a stick in your hand for the first time. Absolutely. And I'm sure a bunch of listeners that uh, many will be lacrosse fans, but I, I kind of hope that they take away that fantastic culture that you, you talked about with the, with the kind of back and forth that will be going on. And uh, I love what you brought up about seeing and touching and feeling, because I think it, it's so important that lacrosse has more of that. And one of the questions that goes hand in hand with what you were just talking about was, I, I often ask people who've been in a certain craft or endeavor for such a long time, whether their reasons for staying in it have changed, whether they fell out of love for it, or we had to rekindle their passion for it. So my question to you is, uh, what stayed the same and what has changed as you've been in this long journey of lacrosse from four years old to, to now? Has it all been the same passion that, that started when you were really young or have the reasons changed or, or what has stayed the same? 
<laughs> it's a great question. I mean, when you're in something for, I guess now 45 years or so, um, of course, you know, your passion ebbs and flows in different ways. And, and I, I can talk, you know, specifically about my, my passion to seek out, you know, Josai and, and the opportunity to go, to go work for him. Uh, I was in Denver for 15 years in, in a model franchise in the National Lacrosse League and, and could have stayed there for a, a long time and, and had, um, had a passion for uh, and a love for the Colorado Mammoth and having created and helped create that brand with a lot of really good people and, and launching lacrosse in, in west of the Mississippi uh, you know, to wild crowds and watching the, the, the uh, sport of Denver grow, uh, 2014 World Games, obviously, and, and to seeing the evolution of, of the University of Denver with the hiring of Bill Tierney, uh, the outlaws, you know, all, all of those things um, flourished in the game uh, in, in that market. And so it was super exciting to be a part of. But 15 years later, uh, found myself in a, in a place where I uh, felt like I wanted more and wanted to do more and see more and uh, connected with Joe and, and the opportunity presented itself uh, where a seat at a table that was different than the table that I was sitting at um, and a table that had become old hat for me, uh, which that's fine. But uh, understanding that, that Joe's um, new passion for the game of lacrosse and the growth of lacrosse in, in so many different kind of uh, parallel tracks, if you will, National Across League, PLL, uh, media, television, you know, all, all the basketball uh, uh, engagement, uh, just to see his passion for the sport and, and for sports in general uh, was something that attracted me to him and, and uh, gave me the opportunity to kind of uh, scratch a different itch. And, and so that was exciting. But, but I will tell you, um, one of the driving factors recently for me was my son, at, who is now a, a shameless plug for the University of Delaware, but he's a junior at Delaware playing lacrosse uh, for Ben DeLuca and their program, which is, uh, which is making a comeback. Excited to see that. But uh, he was about six years old, six, seven, eight years old, and kind of caught this bug and, and, and was really excited about lacrosse in the Olympics. And this was a long time ago. And, and he, he said, you know, D dad, I want to be a part of getting lacrosse in the Olympics. And all I could think of is, well, that's, you know, that's a passion um, that I share and I want to see it happen. And certainly it's been there before back in the early 1900s, but, but uh, for us to have a chance to see our sport ascend into the Olympic rings and be represented in the pantheon of sports, um, I think is a great, greatest of achievements. And, and so um, along with, you know, everybody that competes in our sport and having the opportunity to uh, take that game to the next level. So, uh, you know, that, that's kind of been a recent uh, ignition of, of a flame for me is to see the game get into, into the Olympics for competition and uh, hopefully in LA in 2028. Love it. And, and something that stands out to me is we, we talk about the long time, long time passion that you've had for lacrosse and uh, what struck a chord with me in your response there was the power of the single idea and, and the hope for the Olympics that, that can go from a, a flame to a roaring blaze as long as you stick to it and, and really chase down that mission. Uh, something that you talked about um, in your Inside Lacrosse podcast recently well, it was about the, the non-lacrosse consumer and to uh, the goal of attracting more fans and supporters to the sport uh, of lacrosse. Um, why do you think it's so important or why is it so important to you to expand lacrosse and, and what specific strategies do you think are, are big in bringing that growth? Well, it's a pretty broad question, Mark, and I, I, I think that – becomes an underlying passion for me and I, and I think and constant right you talk about a singular focus and um, I'm I've almost become a broken record on the board of, of the National Lacrosse League and and now the board of World Lacrosse and and a number of other boards with Team Canada and others is our game um, doesn't connect with enough consumers um, and, and I think there's some great initiatives that are moving in the right direction for that. I, I certainly have a, 
massive amount of respect for what the, the Rabels are doing in, in the PLL and, and the endeavor that they're creating to bring the sport to the masses uh, in, in, on an NBC platform uh, that is a widespread distribution platform. Um, I feel like there's a, a very village-based opportunity that, uh, and, and I'll talk about three things, three, three actions uh, that are super important or, or three drivers of the actions. Um, but engaging with the sport, there's three of us that have a vested interest in seeing the growth of the sport. And that's the professional teams, the national governing bodies, and, and the manufacturers. Um, college lacrosse, uh, while um, their efforts and energies are admirable in trying to win games and recruit players, their focus mostly is on uh, the activity and the competition because they don't have large infrastructures to be able to go out and grow the game in, in a meaningful fashion. And, and so I don't want to insult the guys that are actually doing that uh, on the side. And I know if you talk about uh, Bill Tierney and Matt Brown and, and those guys doing a great job with Denver Elite and U.S. Boxla and, and a number of other activities, there's probably coaches around uh, college lacrosse that are doing good work. Um, but that being said, the three that have the vested interest, the national governing bodies who, you know, the U.S. lacrosse, uh, the CLA, and the national governing bodies around the world, um, unfortunately, just don't have a significant amount of resources and money. And, and their job is to raise more money um, to, in essence, administer the game. And I think much of their focus has gone to that administration rather than the growth platform. Uh, and then, you know, uh, our, our friends in the, in the manufacturing business, um, they have a size of a market, right? A size of a pie. And, and their job is to capture market share. Uh, and I've for many and, and have had really good conversations, you know, with Dave Morrow when he was with Warrior and, and having a number of conversations about how and what we need to do to grow that consumer base. Um, and then you go to, to, the, to the, the teams themselves in markets around the country, around North America. And our efforts, if, if you want to talk specifically about the SEALs and previously the Mammoth, and I know a number of other teams in the NLL and, and the PLL and, and MLL is our engagement uh, is to attract new consumers, ultimately who become ticket buyers or merchandise buyers or, or whatever type of consumption that they choose, whether they see it in the building or they watch it on television or streaming live or whatever the case may be. Um, the fact is our pie is not big enough. And so engaging that outer ring of the pie rather than trying to uh, and, and you see it in club lacrosse a lot nowadays is, is we're trying to teach kids the game at the highest level and we're just kind of everybody's taking one player from one group and to another group and instead of really the base grassroots level of growth of our lacrosse game should be in an effort and in, 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 in an endeavor to try and find new families that want to embrace our sport and some come by it organically and very naturally because they see it and they like it. Uh, or have friends and family play. And on my podcast, I always ask the question of who put the stick in your hand for the first time? And, and it's a pretty interesting question to hear that. I told you my story. I'm sure you have one and you can remember very vividly what your story is. Um, because it's like that baseball glove for every kid. I, I'm sure you had one when you were a kid. I certainly played baseball when I was a kid. I remember who gave me that glove. Like that glove has a a very important connection. The stick in the game of lacrosse is a, is a uh, much more intimate connection, I believe, and, and it's an extension of your body. Um, and ultimately, it's like, where do we put that stick in our hand? And so when we talk about diversity in the game, and man, I'm getting into another topic crazy enough. Um, but, but as we talk about diversity in the game, uh, it's about creating opportunities for kids that look alike to be able to play so that they're not the only kid walking onto a team or a field or a game uh, and looking around going, I don't look like these kids, right? It's, it's putting sticks in hands of a multitude of, of different demographics, whether it be at, you know, the upper middle class suburban kid that, that gets to play lacrosse and we want to see them join our game as much as, you know, they're playing soccer. We want them to join our game. Um, but seeing it, you know, and we want to do it uh, in, in the lower income demographics 
uh, inner cities or otherwise uh, where kids aren't playing the game. We want to get a stick in their hand. So I think that's the number one opportunity that we can do is put a stick in their hand and put it in their hand with a guy that looks like them and, and engages and, and connects with those kids so that they stay with it for the longer term. But next is we have to provide the platform for them to play outside of just those clinics and, and provide a space for them to do it in a safe uh, and nurturing environment and provide coaches and, and all those opportunities. So those, that's where our pro teams have a huge impact um, and I think have to have that impact. And that's why when you see the growth of expansion around the National Lacrosse League, it's so very important for us to give uh, to seed those grassroots efforts because that's a long-term ticket buyer, you know, strategy, uh, which San Diego, we have, you know, we have a long-term strategy here and it's not going to happen overnight. We're going to fill that building uh, because A, it's a great product, but B, because people identify with the, the people that are playing guys like yourself and your teammates. Um, but, but again, I look at it from the perspective really um, you know, when I see the game on TV and it connects to people that that's where people, and players, young players look around and they go, man, I love watching the game. I love going to the game. I love the popcorn and the, and the cotton candy as a five-year-old kid. But they also identify when they turn, they flick channels and dad or mom or whomever puts the game on and it's sitting there in your living room and you can go, wow, I make this connection. And then I get to go out and play the sport in the park or, or do whatever. And I get to go play the game. And, and it, it can't just simply be family connections that continue to grow our sport. We have to get out of that and we have to extend the brand. So sorry, long answer. No, it was excellent. Excellent. And you touched upon oh, many things and I really want to stick with what you said there at the end. A lot of the terms that you were using is uh, opportunities early on uh, in, 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 in child's lives, relationships, nurturing environment, grassroots, organic. And I want to stay there um, kind of going more towards you, right? Cause I think you gave a well put answer and it gives our listeners awesome um basically a, a view on, on, on the inside of what's going on in lacrosse. You talked about the, the need for a village based opportunities of the professionals and the national governing bodies and manufacturers. But I want to come to you and, and cause I come from the camp and I believe in the power, like you were talking about uh, of coaches, mentors and parents and those relationships really early on. I, I remember having a conversation with coach Ben Ives last year and he talked about those relationships at a very young age stick with you forever. And I, I last year going to those different schools as a San Diego seal, seeing the kids faces light up. I've been to Japan I, I, and seen kids crying when you walk into their school, cause it's something new and something different. Well, when you reflect Steve, personally, you, um, which people come to mind as your greatest influences in your personal development and your professional career? Well, there's one I think that stands out that was was part of my um, obviously formative years. Uh, started as a, as a coach when I was about 12, uh, whose name is Jack Crosby, who is somewhat of an icon uh, in the game of lacrosse, Hall of Fame coach and, and builder uh, in in British Columbia, Burnaby specifically. Um, was a huge, huge supporter of the game. And funny enough, in the same person I talked to, uh, Tom McIntosh, who we grew up uh, together, um, he ended up working for Jack in Jack's trophy store. So there was a trophy store. Jack did all the trophies for lacrosse in British Columbia. He had a captive audience. Um, but every time you walked in, and, and I'm sure, you know, everybody has someone like this in their life, but Later on in my life, as I went to college and began to get into the pros, and um, I would walk into the trophy shop and sit in Jack's office, and we would just sit there and, you know, whatever the topic, obviously it was lacrosse, but um, I know that that happened in, in you know, Orangeville, Ontario with, uh, uh, with Terry Sanderson, who would sit in his sports store, and there was, there was a number of and you'd always find lacrosse people hanging around the trophy shop. And he passed away uh, not too long ago. There's a picture hanging of him in the Burnaby Arena. It's called Copeland Arena, but the Burnaby Arena. Um, and, and his trophy shop, my, my good friend Tom, my best man at my wedding, continues to run that trophy shop while he fights fires on the side. But um, he, was, he was the guy that, was, uh, that engaged with me on that. But uh, – I would say, you know, taught me one of the probably the most important things to me is the ability to coach and and what to do in the process of coaching and 
Uh, I coached, you know, and, and, and that giving back, right. That, that sense to always turn around and give back to the game. Um, you know, it, it's only recently, probably in the last 10 years that coaches started to get paid in the game of lacrosse, um, which I find interesting. And then people have turned it into a business and, and created this platform where we're trying to scale coaching. Um, my challenge uh, with scaling coaching or technique or even labeling, you know, moves and names and all the things that, that, you know, some people are trying to do right now is what it forgets uh, and what is lacking in that whole process of commercializing coaching uh, has been this challenge where the greatest relationship, I think, um, you know, obviously between teachers and, and children or pupils in the classroom is there's a really intimate relationship with a coach and a player. And it doesn't matter the age. Uh, it, the connection uh, that I have with a number of kids that I coach throughout, and I had the great pleasure of coaching a young team from the very early formative stages of them joining the game in second grade. And, they, and I've watched them to a number of them who have gone on to play college lacrosse. And they're all in the middle of their college careers right now. And every time I see them, and I haven't coached these kids since before they were in high school, but every time I see them, um, I get coach. They don't call me Steve. They don't call me Mr. Govett. They call me coach. And you know what? That's a really special title. Um, and and that's, that's really, really important. Um, and I think what's lost in this is that uh, the scaling of coaching or trying to scale coaching uh, – foregoes this special bond that you have between players and coaches. That's awesome. Uh, I had um, Coach Chip Davis, my, my prep school coach uh, and teacher while I was at Deerfield Academy on a, a prior episode, and he talked about the difference between transformative and transactional, and I think you were hovering all over it when you were talking about kind of just this uh, commercializing type of coaching versus the, the intimate relationship side of things where – what really stands out to me as most important is kind of the enlightenment empathy you get from that just time investment with an individual and a team. Like there's nothing like it. And I think a lot of what we've talked about so far has, has been a lot about making sure you stick with individuals and teams and organizations like you were with Colorado Mammoth, because there is something to be said about the investment of time and there's an authenticity behind that. And I too agree with you in the power of something Buddy D called a coach. There's individuals in my life where uh, I might even forget their, their name at, the, at this point because I call them only coach, right? The question <laughs> I want to ask for you is, uh, is you, you've transitioned from player to coach, you know, and then general manager and executive. Um, and besides the obvious, right, the physicality and the physical conditioning, uh, what, what are the similarities and differences that you've uh, seen and still utilized as your roles have changed um, from player to coach and then uh, executive? Yeah, I think it's a really good question. And I think underlying all of uh, whether you go from a player to a coach and, and look, I wasn't always the best, you know, um, most talented player. I wasn't the best teammate. I wasn't uh, the smartest player. I didn't do things the best. And so this is, as you move on through the process, this is a do as I say, not as I did um, type of scenario, but I'm, uh, you know, I'm a firm believer uh and, and again, you learn a ton as you go through this process, right? Uh, the things that I would have told you as a general manager back in my days in Washington, uh, Washington Power, as, as I left the Philadelphia Wings and just before I went to the Colorado Mammoth, um, we had an amazing team. But, but what, the things I did then, um, I, you know, I cringe a little bit sometimes at, at the, at what I did and, and the, the evolution of the process. So constantly learning, I think is an underlying aspect of, of what you have to do. But I, I believe the personal relationships are most important. Uh, and so there's been a number of times that, uh, you know, I've, I've had to fire people. You talk about transactional versus transformational, right? You, you have to fire people, you have to trade people, you have to, you know, and not every decision you ever make in the process of, you know, being an executive or being a, a, a team leader from a general manager's perspective or, or whatever the case may be, not every decision you make is the right one, but you make the decision at the time that you make it with the information you have at the time. And ultimately, um, 
I've always suggested the buck stops somewhere, right? That you have to take responsibility. Um, and that the responsibility for those decisions, I, I live with those consequences and try to learn from them. And some of them have been great and worked out really well. And some of them have been, you know, disastrous. <laughs> and, and ultimately, they're yours. So the decisions that you make, you own. Uh, and I, I take great pride in that. But I, but I also believe, you know, wholeheartedly in, in the process of building relationships. And, and, and so I, even to this day, I was texting, um, Mark, you were one of them, but I was texting guys over the weekend. And just to say, hey, man, I miss you. You know, I'm thinking about you. Um, and that relationship, so that when and if you do have to make decisions that are somewhat adverse to, um, you know, your transactional relationship, right? The, the player has to go somewhere else or, you know, you have to fire somebody because of this. Uh, that that does, the decision is, is, you know, understood that it's not about the person. It's not a, I'm not calling that person incompetent. The actions they might have had might have been that way uh, or mine or whatever the case may be, but the relationship stays intact. I love that. You know, I, one of the top Ted talks that I often refer back to because if I lose sight and a lot of it, a lot of uh, staying on top of your game is the remembrance of the small things. And Robert Waldinger has the number one uh, factor for longevity and health and happiness it is the quality of your closest relationships. That's what I go back to most if I need a reminder of something. And that, that brings in the idea of the soft touch is what you were talking about. I, I, constantly remind myself the importance of having a soft touch so that if you, everybody knows what it feels like when somebody reaches out after months or years of not talking, you know, it, it, what do you want from me? Right. What do you need from me? Right. Because you haven't been talking to me this entire time and that's what you were all over. Two other things that you brought up that were really great um, was the extreme ownership of what you've done. Right. And I think there's something to be said about that. Right. Jocko Willits wrote a whole book on it and how it could be applicable to business, but also to life and also in, in, in military is taking extreme ownership for all of your actions, right? Good, bad, or otherwise. And uh, I loved your vulnerability of saying, I wasn't the best at this, that, and the other thing, but you were always willing to take ownership of those things. And then a, a, a quote that I love that, that, that explains forgiveness is giving up hope for a better past. And this, this podcast is all about peak performance, which is expression of your, the best quality action in the present moment, which is can us being engaged uh, with one another, uh, but also being um, forward thinking and having vision. So one of the attributes, uh, Steve, of yours that I admire the most is your ability to lead and speak about vision uh, in the bigger picture while simultaneously taking care of the day-to-day -day, um, tasks. So where and how would you say you've come to build that skill set? Yeah, I, well, I'm, I'm adamant about good people. Um, and, and you can provide a vision. <laughs> I, I laugh a little bit because, you know, um, I, I'm, I'm surrounded now by a bunch of Yale guys. So I know I'm not the smartest guy in the room. So <laughs> I got to be good at something. And that's, uh, I, I like to make people laugh. And I think humor is a, a really important part of the process. Um, but understanding where our destination is and that that destination can um, change over time. It can, uh, it can move slightly, you know, to the east or the west, but understanding the true north uh, and, and your vision for where the flag is in the sand and saying, uh, that's our destination, people. We're going here. As I think is vitally important for any organization uh, is to understand what your end goal is. And the end goals can shift, right? The goalpost can change. Uh, it can get deeper or, or shorter. It can go left or right. But ultimately, understanding that you have a vision uh, and that you want, um, that you have a way of doing things. My kids will tell you um, as, as a and when they were little, I would say good enough is not good enough. And I said it a lot. Um, and, and understanding that, you know, as a parent, the destination was creating quality athletes, or sorry, adults. Um, and, that, and that the end goal, you know, there was process of teaching moments throughout, you know, 
being a father and, uh, and, and a coach, right? As my job was not about teaching kids how to pick up a ball, wasn't about how to throw the ball in the net, even though I liked it when they did that. Uh, and I enjoyed as much as anyone else, the kind of really engaging and fun, um, you know, kind of real time results of what you were doing with kids. But ultimately my job was to create great adults. Uh, and, and, you know, in the process of, of recruiting and all the rest of it, it wasn't about where the destination was. It was about, you know, the journey and how to get there, but understanding that the destination um, was, you know, was the goal, right? And, and making sure that we were focused towards that and, and that we were heading towards True North. So organizationally, it's the same thing as suggesting that, you know, you, you find what your end goal is, and then you try and find really good people, right? The, the good to great kind of expectations in the book are to have, you know, you have a bus and you're going towards the direction and you don't need to know the direction until you have the bus and then you have the right people on the bus and then you qualify and figure out who and where those people sit on the bus. Um, that's, I think, my biggest role in the organizational process is to make sure that we have good people, right? Uh, and you, you're, uh, you have seen the evidence of that as I hired a guy like Patrick Merrill right, who focuses his attention completely and solely on the success of the team on the field so that I don't have to meddle in that process. And certainly I have a hand and we discuss and talk and um, he listens to me sometimes, sometimes he doesn't. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's trust, right? It's about finding the destination, finding the right people to get you to the destination then putting them in the right roles and then ultimately trusting that they're going to do their job. And so I have some really amazing people around me and, and guys like Josh Gross and uh, who, who, you know, and um, you know, Mike Grace and, and, uh, and J Luke, Luke Gilbert, and a number of these other people that work, work for the seals in the, in the top of the organization, but Patrick and Josh Anderson and, and, and these guys that are working through it and a captain like Brody Merrill, who you trust to take care of your, locker room, right? And, and to make sure that we have accountability in that locker room, it's, uh, it's really about finding good people, in my opinion. And, and that's, um, so I take little credit uh, in where we go. I think it's just setting the expectation of, of where we want to go, and then putting the right people in place, and then letting them do their jobs. Love it. And then, then the hard part, Mark, is adjusting when you stray. Right. When you don't get to um, when you don't get to the destination or that it's taking too long to get to the destination, that's where the buck stops. And you have to you have to evaluate and reevaluate a who's in the seats. Are they in the right seats? Are they the right people? Uh, and sometimes you have to make adjustments and sometimes those are unpopular decisions. And that's where, um, you know, being a leader, everybody can lead in the calm waters. Right. It's, uh, it's leading in the rough waters that become uh, difficult when you're exposed, when you're, when you're vulnerable, is the word you used earlier, when, when other people, especially in the arena of what we work in, in sports, right, where other people watch what you do. I don't go down to, you know, uh, Joe's welding shop and tell him that he's not welding correctly. Um, he just gets judged on a commercial basis by whether people hire him to weld, right? In our case... Uh, in sports, you know, you get judged on a lot of different things and we're, we're on display quite a lot. And there's a lot of people that can take pot shots at you, but you got to be able to take that, you know, and live with the, you know, having the thick enough skin to make hard decisions in the time when, um, you, you know, things aren't going well. Jersey Greg Gregorick once said, hard choices, easy life, easy choices, hard life. And it's as simple yeah. as that. Uh, uh, my mentor and I go back and forth with them, whether energy is caught or taught. Uh, and we've come to conclusion then it's most likely caught. It's by, by having the right people around, right? Rather than uh, when so somebody walks into a locker room or a uh, meeting room, it, it, energy is caught more and more than it is taught. And another thing, staying on top of uh, Dr. Gilbert for one more second is uh, he challenged me. Uh, he always says to me, stop attempting to be well-rounded, be sharp edged, be a monomaniac with a mission. Uh, there's enough people that are well-rounded. And I think that's interesting how that's so contrary, right? Because 
you talked about it many times in your last response that it's important to have the right good people in the right position in order to get you to that destinations, which isn't always uh, uh, stable, right? It's, it's sometimes malleable and, and moving. Um, and the last thing I would like to say about that is um, when, when I look at the, the greats, the, regardless of what field it is, they all have conviction. They all have conviction. I don't, I don't care who you talk about. They all have conviction in the decisions that they make, right? So uh, it's so important to have the right people because energy is caught, not taught. But as a, on an individual basis, I think it's so important uh, to have conviction. Being around lacrosse and sports in general for so long, Steve, what, what characteristics or qualities stand out as most important to you and athletes you've been around, the players you've coached, uh, and ones that you've looked to nurture personally along your journey? Yeah. Interesting, and, and just to, I do think that having conviction, and just, I just want to finish a thought uh, about what you were talking about, but having conviction is important, and, and the, you know, the hard, sharp edges are important, and, and being kind of in the fray uh, constantly is important, but I do think that the, on the softer side, love, love is vital in a locker room, and any organization, right? The love or the passion for what you're doing, the love and the passion for each other, um, you know, and, and that when the edges must be sharp, right? Love allows you to kind of navigate those sharp edges and, and making sure that it's important, but, and, and humor, right? I, I think the ability to make each other laugh, um, while we're focused and directed, um, breaks down barriers to create that, that loving environment. And, and not to get you know too soft, but ultimately um, that's where I, I'll say it again. When when you talk about you know what characteristics are important, I think the the ability to to em, embrace and be passionate about the smallest of things that kids can do in a in a coaching environment or a player, and to appreciate um, you know that not everybody right appreciate the role right. Mark, you're not a great goal scorer by any stretch of the imagination, but um, understanding that I have a great appreciation for the, you know, I would jump into your foxhole. You're the, you're the type of guy I want to be in your foxhole. Um, and so embracing that, that whether it's kids or employees or, uh, or st that everybody has a, uh, a positive contribution and recognizing that, you know, sometimes it's difficult, right? Sometimes you want staff members to be different than they are. Um, but understanding and appreciating, um, they do have some really positive qualities and, and we want to extenuate, you know, we want to extend those great qualities, but we also want to help to nurture the conversation about what can you do to be better? What can I do to be better? I, I, I spend a lot of time in conversations going, look, I'm, I'm not an expert. I am not the person that's an expert in, let's say, digital marketing, which is a you know different world that we're in now, right? I'm not an expert, um, but I have a basic knowledge of understanding. I do have an expert, I'll go hire an expert, and then understanding how he manages his people and, and interacts in, in those, those really interesting times uh, because he has expertise that we need, but making sure that he's active in a lot of other areas to help us because again small organization got a lot of people doing a lot of things mm. um so i don't know if i answered your question but uh no, you definitely um, did. i yeah I, I just think uh having a love and appreciation for what is great in people uh is super important while also nurturing the other things because not everybody's perfect right we, we might be really good at one thing but not great at something else um so we shouldn't throw that person out I, I would just emphasize that there's probably nothing more important to have conviction about than love, right? So I'll, I'll just, I'll put an emphasis button on, on what you're talking about there. That Well, uh, people talk about chemistry, Mark, in a locker room, right? But but what they, I mean, we're men, right? But burly men that play lacrosse. What we don't, what, what chemistry is in a locker room is really a love for those other guys in the locker room. And, and you've been in many of them where you're in, in Yale, right? And what Andy Shea did for you guys and, and instilling in you the passion that you had for the guy next to you, right? And and the the sacrifice, I mean, look, we don't sacrifice a lot to play lacrosse, 
Um, but at the end of the day, that, that what you were willing to do on behalf of the guy next to you, that shows great love. And I think we don't spend enough time in our game or any other sport talking about the love in a locker room um, because that's the greatest teams I ever played on. And, and you know, Tony Resch, uh, Yale alum, um, who I had on my podcast last week, you know, ultimately – we still talk to each other, right? We still, that whole team of guys on the Philadelphia Wings in the early 90s that ultimately can be looked back at as a dynasty, um, you know, th there was great love and continues to be, right? I, I stay in touch with Chris Bates and Scott Gabrielson. I, I talk to all these guys on a constant basis. It had more to do with just playing a game. It had more to do with just trying to win the championship that year. It had everything to do with the fact that we cared about each other. I love it. I absolutely love it. And the, the uh, example that comes to my mind is there, there, Simon Sinek, who wrote the book, uh, Starts With Why. He has this short video um, in which he talks about why good leaders make you feel safe. Uh, and it's because they, he or she does one thing. Uh, they let you know that they would do the same for you. right? And I think that that's huge in, in when it comes to chemistry in a locker room, in a boardroom. Right. And, and, and where I want to go next is the love that you have with your, with your family and, and, and friends. So on top of your professional responsibility, Steve, you're a devoted father, husband, uh, and friend to many. Um, do you find it easy to handle all, all these multiple uh, duties uh, effectively? Uh, and if so, or if not, uh, what strategies do you use or, or work on on a daily basis to stay on top of it all? Uh it's interesting. Uh, obviously, um, I have a, a rock star for a wife uh, who puts up with my um, puts up with me uh, and my idiosyncrasies in a, in a massive way. So I don't sit here and pretend any part of uh, being a a great husband or a great father. I'm I'm part of a team, and um, I think from the very beginning of being a father, we always talk to her. My, my wife is a teacher, right? So she's spends a lot of time in classrooms and has taught for 20 something years, 25 years in the class. She's actually going back, uh, you know, this week uh, because she decided in San Diego, she wasn't helping anybody during the pandemic as a teacher and was tired of, of watching uh, others go in. And so she's going in as an assistant teacher when, a, you know, a massive, pay cut for her, but it wasn't about that. It was about her ability to help in a classroom and, and to contribute during this time frame. Uh, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm blessed uh, with an, a, an amazing relationship with an amazing person. Um, and with my kids, when early on in the process, because she was a teacher, I, I learned a whole lot about um, <laughs> how you um, label activity rather than the person so you, you're not a bad kid you're acting bad right and so we need to modify the behavior because you're a good kid who's acting poorly um and so you know and it was a lot of talking to your kids uh like they're humans right not like they're um minions not like they work for you not like they're uh your uh indentured servants it was more about talking to them like they're human beings uh, and, and, you know, providing a, a, a platform for them to grow and learn. And, uh, you know, you, you stop short of letting them stick their fingers in the, in the light socket, but, you know, you want them to learn from their mistakes and, and hopefully, you know, they understand not to make them and you give them guidance. But, um, but, you know, as far as friends go, I, I would say, um, I don't know that I have a ton of friends. I, uh, to me, the, the you know intimate relationship of a friendship means a ton of investment in in time and energy, and um, I, I have certain I have a lot of people that I'm friendly with, um, but there are certain people that I I very value or significantly value their um, my relationship with them, and and ultimately uh, picking and choosing um, very carefully. Uh, the people that I choose to extend energy uh, with. So our energy is important together, but um, that, that's not, it's not easy. I mean, I, I certainly have a lot of people that I consider to be um, 
friends, I guess, uh, but really close. Um, it, it's a smaller group of, of, of people. So how do you how do you manage that? I think you. I want to put everything into those relationships, and so regardless of when we choose to engage on the energy, it's the same, right? So if you don't talk to somebody for 20 years, it's, you have that same energy um, that you had 20 years ago. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that you constantly reach out and, and just say, hey, and um, I think it's incumbent upon people to, um, you know, if you leave a message for somebody, it's, it's, you don't have to get that call back right away. Um, you don't have to, you don't have to sit by the phone and wait for somebody to respond to the text. It's just a matter of, it's good enough to know that you put the text out into the ether and told somebody that you, uh, you miss them or told them that, uh, you, you're hoping the best for them in a situation, uh, and not the selfish response that making sure that, that you didn't get the response back. Right. And you get the endorphin of, of the, the like on the social media post, right? It's why do you do it? And, and, uh, and ultimately it's because uh, you did it uh, because, because it was the right thing to do. And I, I think ultimately that permeates through a lot of relationships and that last a long time. So um, meandering through a pathway here, not, not really getting to the point. No, but. I love it. And it's something that I want to pull the thread on is the investment of time and energy and, and, and give a plug to the sport that we love. Right. So it, you've been around lacrosse and you've given time and energy and love and commitment and conviction and all the things we've been talking about as a player. And, and as a coach, you've won and lost, you know, championships and been through uh, the world stage. Right. And, and, and all the way back to when you picked the game up uh, at four years old, what is it about the lacrosse community that's so special to you? Right. For a list uh, that doesn't uh, know too much about lacrosse, right? That, that kind of wants to know why we love this sport and why is it not big enough yet and all that. What is it about the lacrosse community uh, that's special to you? I think we always used to say as, as I went to college in the early 90s um, that there was this fraternity, right? Uh, there was a, that there was this, this brotherhood. Um, and it was, a, it's amazing that today, um, it still exists um, when you see somebody with a sticker on their car or their, uh, and I don't know, Mark, if you remember when STX used to put a sticker in every um, string kit. And when you'd see that sticker on a, somebody's car, you had a kinship with that person. Um, it goes both ways though, right? Because um, just because you had a kinship with that person as a lacrosse person or they picked up the game. Um, that was great, but that was an indicia that, that basically the game was too small because chances are, uh, you talk about Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation, right? Chances are you could have a conversation with that car passing you on I 70 in Colorado. Uh, you know, in the early nineties when you're driving from, um, Radford, Virginia, back to Vancouver, and you saw this car with a with a uh, STX sticker on it. The chances are, if you stopped and had a conversation at a rest area with that person, it wouldn't take long for you to name one or two people that you knew that ultimately you could reconnect with. Uh, you know, and there was probably two degrees of separation. Uh, and so, my hope for our game um, is to have millions of consumers so that I don't have two degrees of separation in the game of lacrosse anymore. Um, and that, so it's, it's kind of dual, it's, it's a dual purpose here, Mark. I, I'm, I struggle with what I love about our game is this, this great connection that we have. One, I go back to a very spiritual connection to the game and the stick means so much and, and where it comes from uh, with, the, with the history of the game uh, and the indigenous people playing and what, what that game meant to them and where it came from uh, for it was given to them by the creator. And so there's this very spiritual connection to the game of lacrosse. Uh, I'm not sure everybody playing the game today understands that or has that background or history. Uh, you know, go listen to Cody Jamison talk uh, at some point about the game and what it means to them or Lyle Thompson or, or some of them. I, I think we all have this um, kind of, very spiritual connection to the stick 
and to how the game should be played uh, because of where it comes from. And that, so that's really important to me. But at, at, on, by the same token, I want to see the game grow way beyond its boundaries so that I don't know every, I don't have two degrees of separation from everyone that e either plays or watches. Um, I want the game to be a, an opportunity for somebody to flick on a TV that, you know, that loves the sport for the sport because it's an amazing game to watch no matter what version of the game you're watching, whether it's outdoor, uh, pro, college, uh, international, whether it's indoor, international, or pro, or, or junior, or kids playing, uh, that the game itself is actually attracts people for the game as opposed to everything it stands for. I think you can learn all that through the process, but I would just love to see more kids playing and more people uh, engaging in our sport. What an excellent response. Thank you so much. And I, I think it would be awesome. You know, you talk about the fraternity, the kingship and all that stuff. I had Kylie O'Miller around here. I want to see the women's sport take off. I want all of these different hubs, right, to, to connect, right, and get the wheel moving in one direction. I think that would be awesome. To isn't it fascinating? Sorry, Mark. Isn't no. it fascinating, though, that we are the, really the only sport, if you think about it, right? Ice hockey, every level of ice hockey with the exception of maybe the Olympics and the pro game, right? With a different size sheet of ice, but in essence, every goal is the same size. Every, every time you step on the ice, you're skating with the same types of skates, men, women, right? You have the same equipment, uh, soccer, men, women, right? Indoor. Yeah. has a little bit of a different lacrosse. Women play a different sport than the men. They play with different sticks, different equipment that the, we play box lacrosse. There's, we spend so much time in the game of lacrosse, which bothers the shit out of me, quite frankly. We spend so much time in our game worrying about pro versus college, men versus women, box versus field, U.S. versus Canada. We spend so much energy worrying about how the game is played or who's playing it or how they're playing it or how they were introduced to it or where they came from, New York versus Maryland, you get to be in New Jersey, so it doesn't really count. But, you know, the, right, Yale versus Maryland, you know, like all these things. But what we should be doing is worrying about how we can take whatever version of the game you enjoy and taking that again, up against baseball, taking that up against soccer, taking that up against hockey. And look, you don't have to stop playing any of those other sports, but where the top of our sport becomes a banner. Look, I'm all for multi-sport athletes. I just happen to believe that my son is a multi-sport athlete who played outdoor and then indoor. That was multi-sport in my opinion, because it was two different disciplines, but that, that's just the way I thought. But look, I, I just think our game is so unique and interesting in the way that it's set up is that instead of, all of us pulling on separate chains in our different factions of the sport is we need to get back right to the core of this group and get the sport, whatever format and get more people to play. And that should be our goals and endeavors. I love that. I a hundred percent agree with that. I, to, sorry to get spiritual or biblical with you, but the stone that gets rejected becomes the cornerstone. I'm hoping that's lacrosse and it can really, it's the medicine game for the reason. Uh, and it, you really brought up a, a point which kind of segues two of my questions that I had for you. Two bright spots within the sport that you're very close to are the Iroquois national team inclusion in the 2022 World Games in Birmingham and NLL's plan for expansion um, for, to Fort Worth, Texas next year. Uh, I was going to ask you what your outlook is on those two events, but one, I want to congratulate you on your recent selection for the World Across Border Directors, and I'd rather ask you this question. What are some things you're most looking forward to contributing to in that seat? Great question. Clearly, as I mentioned before, right, the mandate for the 2028 Olympics, and, and that, that's something I want to see happen. But, but again, um, you know, encompassing your conversation, we're at the precipice now of inclusion of our sport in the world games and then ultimately on the world stage. Uh, and we ha it's, a, it's a vicarious position that we're in right now. It's a very slippery slope for those people that don't know this. Um, we're not in yet. The sport of lacrosse is not in yet. And so if we focus 
our collective energy on who plays once we get there, we'll lose sight of the fact that the sport itself, right, becomes becomes kind of the, the victim, if you will, of, of all the negative energy, right? And so we need to focus our energy on getting the sport into these events, getting past our provisional status, which I think is long, long overdue on the world stage for sports. Uh, and we need to focus our attention on, yes, of course, it's important to have all of our athletes, regardless of their persuasion, um, right, and, and their, their sovereignty. We need all of those athletes to compete uh, in, in the games, but the games, the game itself is important to move on and get that into, um, into this, into, you know, the pantheon, if you will, of, of world sport. So again, my, my, my goal here, right, is in 2023, at some point, we're going to find out if we're accepted and moving past this pro provisional stage. And I kind of look at it like we're not invited to the party yet. Right. So we can't talk about who's who we're bringing to the party until we get an invite into the party. Right. Because those people that are deciding whether you get that invite into the party, they're not looking at your group and saying, OK, you can't bring this one and you can't bring that one. And it's not they're just looking at your sport saying, OK, um, you're in or you're out because of certain criteria and measurement tools. And so ultimately we'll get uh, we need to get the sport in. Uh, to the party and then figure out who gets to play um, and then have the platform to discuss uh, our brothers in the game, in, in the Iroquois Confederacy and the Haudenosaunee people to, to put on display their opportunity to extend their sport. But we have work to do. There's, you know, I mean, the, the IOC is a very political animal, Mark, and, and it's hard to explain to a lot of people that it's a political process and there's political procedures and protocols, which um, are not simple, right? And, and the ability to be recognized by the, uh, you know, the United Nations and all those things that have to kind of parallel, in parallel comply uh, to make everyone in the game inclusive. Uh, but I can assure you, everyone that I've talked to uh, on, on the World Games, uh, I'm sorry, uh, at World Lacrosse, everybody I've talked to on the board, everybody I've talked to throughout the game is very passionate about making sure that everyone is included in our sport. I mean, I think the basis of our sport is inclusion. And whether it's U.S., Canada, Iroquois, or the rest of the, you know, 50-something, 60-something countries that are playing the sport, uh, I think it's important that everybody has the opportunity to represent themselves uh, and their nation, whatever that nation is, uh, in the Olympics. And we're going to work real hard to make that happen. So uh, I don't think anybody's sitting here going, yeah, we're going in and, you know, damn the torpedoes, screw everybody. We're getting in no matter what. There's a process and we have to follow the process. So, um, yeah, I mean, look, I want to see, I want to see world game competition um, that's fair and exciting, but I also want it to be um, consumptive, right? I want it to be, available for consumers to see our sport. And it, and it comes back to, um, I love the game so much that I believe everybody should love it, but I'm also not of the mind that it's so entrenched uh, in tradition that it can't change, right? It can't morph um, in order to become a more consumer um, platform or, or a more consumer centric or focused platform. And, and that's why, you know, I'm constantly in the national cross league perspective, looking at rules. Uh, I'm, I'm chairman of the competition committee there. And, and we're always looking at rules, trying to make it better, trying to make it better for TV, trying to make it better uh, for new consumers to watch so that it's, it's a simple game. Um, you know, you watch basketball, pretty simple game to understand, right? Put the ball in the basket. It's five guys. That's the court. It's easy to understand. Uh, soccer, pretty easy to understand. Uh, I think there's lots of, of rules in lacrosse that people watch for the first time and go, that guy just threw the ball out of bounds at the net. Why does he get it back? Makes no sense. It's not intuitive, right? And so there's lots of people saying, you know, well, lacrosse, I don't understand it. 
I think box lacrosse is a little more understandable. It's a little faster. It's a little easier to get. Uh, aside from the fact that why are the you know why is the state by Marshall Marshmallow Man and goal? But that's another conversation for another day. I mean, I think ultimately um, we have to make our game more consumable. Um, and and this new Olympic vision, Olympic ideal, is is interesting. But I think what people need to do is embrace the fact that the game is not, like look at where we were like the. Our sport, less than 100 years old in box lacrosse, because the tr owner of the Toronto Maple Leafs and the owner of the uh, Montreal Canadiens had an empty building in the summertime and said, hey, let's take these lacrosse guys and let them play on the dirt, right? They just made a game up, right? The National Lacrosse League in 1987 had, had Russ, uh, Russ Klein and Chris Fritz say, hey, let's do this thing on rollerblades. And that didn't work. But they brought the game on turf to U.S. markets. Around. That was new then. And look, we're 35 years later, right? The PLL, you know, taking the shot clock and shortening the field. It's not sacred. Our game is not sacred. You can change the rules to make it more consumable. And everybody, relax. It's okay. We'll survive. Because guess what? Hockey used to play with six on six. And they finally took it off because it was too many guys. It was too, the ice was too small at that point, six on six plus a goalie, right? Hockey used to play that way, right? And, and games evolve. Football, look at the rule changes in football. It's a consumable product. It's about television. We have to adapt. Well, uh, your passion is evident, man. And uh, I thank you for your love of the game. I, like I said, it, and energy is caught, not taught. So if you keep it up, <laughs> thank you so much for being a guiding light and a trailblazer. And I'm sure you're going to do amazing stuff on, on the board. Um, I have two more questions for you. It seems like a through line mission in your life uh, is to grow the sport of lacrosse. That's evident, right? But but I want to make sure that I and other listeners get the full view of your story, right? As, as Coach John Wooden said, uh, it's what you learn when you think you know it all that counts. So are there any other motivations or reasons why you continue to remain opportunistic like building the San Diego Seals, like joining uh, the, the, the board of directors, working hard and leading teams and others? Um, motivations and reasons in your life other than uh, the growth of, of lacrosse? Yeah, I think that uh, familiar familial duty, right? I, I, I look at my, uh, my father um, who didn't play the game of lacrosse, uh, but continue to say, you know, if, it's, if, it, if you're gonna do something, you know, do it right. Um, and, and an honest day's work for an honest day's pay, right? A simple, uh, my father was a, was a World War II veteran who, you know, did, literally grew up in the Depression. And, um, you know, I, I, we didn't, I, I came from a modest middle class family, uh, like many Canadian lacrosse players do. Um, and ultimately, right, that, that duty to where I came from, that modest middle class opportunity and and i've talked to you about it as well is that opportunity where where i was given to get a stick in my hand um you know and and what lacrosse meant to me and and as you mentioned right 2018 i was swimming in the mediterranean ocean in in natanya israel and i joe and i had this conversation when we were there going we're in israel at a world lacrosse event, right? It was one thing to be in Denver in 2014, but in Manchester in 1994 and uh, all these places. But, but ultimately I just feel like there's a duty to uh, give back to the game. And that, that passion that was instilled in me by a long time ago by Jack Crosby and my parents and, and other people around the game and, and, you know, just to scrap and fight for my teammates as a, you know, as a, a pretty aggressive young man and playing the game and, and understanding that I got to go to all these places and to play lacrosse. You know, I, I just think there's a duty to continue to pass that along. And uh, I have this great opportunity to be compensated for what I do now, but uh, in the seals, but uh, this job of trying to, provide platforms and opportunities for new people to enter our sport, whether it be through, 
you know, the, the consumption window of, of television, right? And watching our game as a media platform, whether it's putting a stick in the hand of a kid in a clinic, uh, whether it's starting a program here where, again, putting our money where our mouth is, we're, we wanna start a SEALs-based inner city program. Uh, and I hear about diversity in our sport and how this is a, a sport of white privilege. Well, the only way to change that is not to talk about it and not to wear t-shirts and not to make statements and do videos, which we've done, by the way. But it's actually to start a program where these kids can go to a place where they look like the kid that's sitting next to them playing, right? And great passion for the guys in Denver who, who've worked on Denver City Lax and using them as a, as a template for that. Um, but there's so many different avenues, Mark, where I feel like I can have an impact. Uh, and those avenues, you know, are about expansion of our game in lacrosse, right? So working on that, making sure the rules are consumptive, uh, making sure that, you know, and, and so having a hand in the accountability of our sport uh, and making sure that we have this blowtorch of marketing out there uh, that gives every possible opportunity. Um, you know, again, television, grassroots, um, digital marketing, introducing the sport, putting on a great show, right, which I'm very, very proud of with the SEALs and was very, very proud of with the Mammoth, that good people came together to put on this massive, you know, uh, spectacle, if you will, around the game, not just what happens on the floor, because you guys do an unbelievable job of playing the game to make it a spectacle and it's fun to watch. And I admire every player that continues to play and coach the coaches and, and all the work that goes in behind the scenes for the people that put on national cross league games and other uh, pro sports, but the show, right? The fireworks and the, you know, all the things that go around it and the, and the dancing and the, and the, the announcers and the music. And, and you know, and I don't know where the circus ends and the game starts. And I don't know that I ever want to know. Um, I just want people to come and enjoy it. Mm -hmm. Whatever they choose to enjoy I know they'll fall in love with the sport. And that happened in Colorado when 16,000 people were lined up outside Pepsi center for our first game. And they walked in thinking they were going to see a lacrosse game and they fell in love with the spectacle. And for the last 15 years have filled that building. Um, and I'm not sure why they keep coming, but I don't know. I don't want to know. Right. Um, I don't want to know what their specific reasons are. I just want to know that we're doing the right things and we did the right things there and, and we're going to continue to do the right things uh, here in San Diego and, and hopefully in, in maybe a couple other markets as well. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I love the word duty and how you were emphasizing it, right? When I think of the word duty, what comes to mind for me is uh, like three words, no matter how you look at it, opportunities, choices, consequences, right? Of any, of any kind. And I look to you and I say, wow, here's a man who's providing a lot of opportunity, not just for men like myself, but other individuals um, of all different ages. And it's been great to get to know you to build such a great relationship. Um, and the last question I always turn over, um, you've been around the sport of lacrosse, right? You've worn all these different hats and, and you've seen uh, different variations of greatness. Uh, how do you define it yourself? Uh, I think that epitaph is yet to be written. I don't, I don't know the answer, Mark. Um, I just know that there's work to be done. And again, I, I think it's the commitment to the duty. Um, you know, I, it's the commitment to to give everything I have and sometimes trampling on feelings and sometimes, you know, um, not the most empathetic person ever, you know, and, and sometimes being, a, you know, kind of overbearing in the process, but always understanding that it's, it's a connection to, you know, what's the job and what, what do we, what, what do we do next? And you know what? at the end of the day, people will write the epilogue and that judgment will be done then. So um, how do I measure it? Would I love to measure it in more championships? Hell yeah. I mean, yeah, of course I want to win more. Um, do I measure it in more people who have fallen in love with the game from the time I was, you know, running onto the field in, in, in the spectrum in Philadelphia to how many people are, engaged in the sport today, 20 something, 25 years later, 
um, yeah, I take great pride in, in the fact that, you know, there's, you drive down the street sometimes in any particular suburban neighborhood or otherwise, and there's a lacrosse goal. You know, there's a kid walking down the street with a lacrosse stick in his hand. I take great pride in that. I, I probably had very little to do with putting that stick in his hand, uh, but I still get geeked up when I see, hey, look, that kid's got a stick. Um, I, I still look and, you know, um, I, I take great pride in, in seeing full buildings. That, that to me is the measure of our success, right? And walking in and you play there in Saskatchewan where it's full and it's 15,000 people screaming about a sport that five years ago they didn't know anything about, right? And, uh, you know, 300, 400,000 people, 600,000 people watching a game on Twitter. Like those, that, that gets me excited is the number of people that fall in love with our sport because every opportunity, every chance to expose someone to the game is an opportunity that we, they create that four-year-old kid when his mom turns to him and says, Hey, you want to play lacrosse? And that kid goes, yeah, I want to play lacrosse. And so that is our job and our duty. And everybody that is in our game has a mandate to pass it along in some particular way. I just happen to have a large platform because of the really good people that I've surrounded myself with or, or had the good fortune to engage with guys like Joe Tsai and, and, and Stan Kroenke and, and wonderful people in the national lacrosse league um, that I've got to work with. But, but I just love seeing full buildings. I think that's the measure of our success is, is the number of people that take good hard earned dollars out of their pocket and go buy a ticket to watch our game or right to go, to go subscribe to, you know, NBC gold or BR live or, um, you know, they, they, they went out of their way to find our sport and we've got to go out of our way and spend more money and spend more time to help them find our sport and make it easier for the pathway into the game so that that little kid knows what he's talking about next time. Right. So he knows what the sport is when he says, yeah, I want to play. And it's not just because your friend across the street asked you to. Love it, Steve. You know, well, there's work to be done, right? So let's, well, go, do work to be done. Done. let's go do all of those, you know, Champions, yeah, yeah, let's go the game, sell out. Save yeah. Sounds great. To me. Yes. I hear you. But uh, no, I mean, I, there's a lot of work to do and I, I'm uh, sometimes you wake up in the morning and go, okay, where, where, what do we work on today? Mm. Right. Um, and part of it's being the Pied Piper and starting to bring in others. Uh, and so I uh, was blessed when I had the opportunity to meet Joe and say, Hey, I'd like you to jump into this journey with me. And, uh, and then he's right there. We're shoulder to shoulder trying to figure out uh, what's next. And, and he's uh, he's a passionate partner in that process. And, and that I cherish our friendship probably more um, than I do his ownership of our team. Uh, I cherish his counsel always pushing me forward saying it's not big enough. It's not good enough. Uh, sure. Do more. We can do more. We can get better. Uh, you know, when the, when the Iroquois were faced with the opportunity two, three months ago or two months ago with, uh, with the world games um, issue, uh, he called me and said, what are you going to do about this? <laughs> like, what do you want me to do? There's other people working. No, no. What are you going to do about it? Hmm. And so, being challenged like that is uh, is something I, I value greatly uh, in our relationship. So, um, so passing that along to others within our organization and outside the organization is a challenge to to everybody to continue to do what you're doing, um, right? And to continue to continue to grow and scale your business and get better and keep you know continuing to be the the town crier on the sport of lacrosse and and what that means to grow within the sport of lacrosse. I, I'm I'm proud, you know, to work with guys like yourself and, and the Merrills and, and the list goes on and on. There's a ton of people doing a lot of good work across the board and, you know, U.S. Box, Matt, Matt Brown and people that I have great passion for that because they don't just accept the status quo and they want to change. 100%. All amazing people. And so are you, Steve. Thank oh, you so thanks. much. Thank you so much for joining me on here and, and I appreciate everything. Happy to do it. Excited for what's next.